Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, we are joined by Dr. Bjorn Oscarson, an Associate Professor of Neurology at Mayo Clinic, Florida. Dr. Oscarson will be telling us a bit about our test for neurofilament light chains and how this test has been used clinically. Dr. Oscarson, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you very much for uh, having me and, and uh, thank all the listeners. So I'll start with a, a basic question. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and your role at Mayo Clinic? So I've been at Mayo Clinic now for seven years uh, and I direct the ALS Center of Excellence here in Florida. I was recruited out here after having created a center of excellence in, in California. And when the uh, director here was thinking about retiring, he brought me over and, and we overlapped a bit. And, and uh, yes, I very much enjoy the program here and I've been able to grow it a bit further. Well, that's excellent. We're really glad to have you with us today. Um, Let's talk a little bit about our neurofilament light chain test, uh, NFLC. We launched it back in April of 2022. What was your role with the launch of this new test? So neurofilaments have been a marker of neural injury for, for some time. And, and there are several different forms of neurofilament. Neurofilament light is the one we're talking about today. And it is a marker that can be detected reliably in uh, plasma. And, and that is a much more, so much more useful than having a marker that's only accessible to us in spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. and, and so I've been excited about this the development of neurofilament line for clinical use uh, since I came to Mayo again and was aware that this uh, effort was ongoing at that time um, and, and have been a supporter of getting this test launched because I do believe that it has meaningful benefit to my patients. Yeah, and Mayo Clinic Laboratories was the first uh, reference laboratory to offer this test in plasma. So why was that an important breakthrough in the field? You've mentioned a little bit about how plasma is a less invasive source than say CSF. And it, it just makes it much easier to use, particularly for repeated sampling. And you may be able to get patients to, to uh, do one, spinal fluid draw, uh, and yes, certainly it's possible to get repeated spinal fluid draws, but uh, a test that can be done on plasma is, is um, far more tolerable. It's uh, preferable from the patient standpoint, and uh, it's easier for me organizationally to, to arrange, and uh, uh, the oh, there's lots of advantages for us. I can see, especially for repeat testing, um, you don't want to undergo a lumbar puncture unnecessarily. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what this test really um, does with detecting. What does that mean and how you and other Mayo Clinic physicians have been using this test clinically? I mean, it is a nonspecific marker of neuronal damage. So it is, depending on what kind of question, what diseases you're, you're trying to determine if they're present or not, would indicate, again, different things. My questions tend to be, is it ALS or not? How fast is someone's ALS progressing? Those will be the two main questions. I'm starting to wonder a bit about if it can also tell us if the treatments we're applying, if they are working. Um, so those are kind of the types of questions that I try to answer with this test, but others might be looking for other diseases MS, brain trauma, uh, it's been used in COVID, it's been used in, in many situations. And, and again, depending on, on you, what you're looking for, uh, it might be answering somewhat different answers, it's a nonspecific marker. Yeah, it's my understanding that neurofilaments are located exclusively in the neuronal cytoskeleton, the neuronal cytoskeleton, and are released into interstitial fluid upon axonal injury or neurodegeneration. So I guess this could be applicable as a nonspecific marker across a variety of neurologic diseases. You mentioned some, ALS, MS. For our listeners, can you just define what those are? Yes, so amyotrophic lateral sclerosis will be where I start because that's the disorder that I spend most of my time on. 
multiple sclerosis would certainly be another one. Uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, TBI would be yet another one. But the list really goes on. Uh, it could be applied in disorders both in the peripheral nervous system and in the center nervous system. Mm -hmm. So uh, its ability to pick up change is seems to be proportional to the amount of damage. So rapidly progressive global disorders uh, seem to show higher levels than diseases that are more localized or more slowly progressive. So it's kind of a measure of amount of damage and, and the speed of damage. Oh, that's helpful. Interesting. Do you have any examples of patients that you've ordered this test for and how it's changed their course of treatment? So the first question that I often ask if somebody has ALS or not. Now, I have a host of different ways to try to help answer that question. History, exam, electrophysiological measures, and now imaging studies also. And often this is not really a test I need there, but sometimes it is very helpful. ALS is a difficult diagnosis to make on occasion. And if we see a very high level of neurofilament life, if somebody's coming in very early, they don't, haven't, don't have much of a story yet, don't have much exam findings, I don't really get it on my electrophysiological measures, and maybe my imaging studies are equivocal, which they often are then a neurofilament level could be a significant piece in, in sort of putting the diagnosis together. Uh, if the levels are markedly elevated, that would strongly argue for rapidly progressive ALS. If you have a normal level, that doesn't fit well with rapidly progressive ALS. I do have patients with ALS who have normal neurofilament light level, but they tend to be more slowly progressive patients, um, and, and sometimes patients with more just localized form of motor nerve disease, primary lateral sclerosis, um, would be the one they really, uh, that we really sometimes don't really see an elevation, even though it is a motor nerve disease. And I guess I, as a nerve and muscle doctor, I also do a lot of creatine kinase values, uh, CKs, and I think of it much in sort of the same way there that a markedly elevated CK suggests muscle disease, but many of my patients with muscle disease have normal CKs and they still have muscle disease. So it doesn't really serve to rule out uh, a, a disease with, with great certainty, but, but to rule in, I think that there it, it uh, can have value. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, it sounds like it's a very helpful tool in your toolbox that you use with all of the other features, clinical, et cetera, to then guide your treatment. And ALS is a disease that generally is very rapidly progressive. The survival at Mayo Clinic in our series are about 19 months from a diagnosis to death. And, and in the community, we're looking at more than 14 months. That may be a bias due to patients coming into us having slightly slower disease. Um, but, but it's very rapid and it's also variable. We see patients with only a few months survival to patients with decades of survival. The neurofilament light predicts the length of survival in ALS and that's well proven by now. Yeah. Uh, and particularly early in the course, it can be difficult, it is difficult to predict someone's future. And this is one piece that I use to, to kind of help shape that prediction model. Um, so, so definitely if we have the time so we know how fast they're going, then that's a much better measure of predicting the future. But sometimes the duration of symptom is very unclear. Most of the time that means that the symptoms are insidious and, and maybe ongoing for a long time, but not always, and, and I think neurofilament light can be very useful there in helping guess someone's future. Well, thank you for the explanation. That's very helpful. As a neurologist who's highly specialized in this area, I can see where this is a test that you would use 
um, what do you think of non-neurologists um, potentially ordering this test? Is this a test that other people besides neurologists should be ordering? There's lots of very competent physicians out there. And, okay. and again, like any other diagnostic test you use, you need to be kind of aware of the strengths and weaknesses of the test. With, with that kind of knowledge of the test, again, if somebody gets used to using it and start appreciating the strengths and weaknesses of the test, I think that it certainly can be used. Anytime you use a new tool, it's uh, a little bit awkward until you kind of hit your stride and get used to it. I mean, you read the literature and, and you ask colleagues who've used it more uh, to kind of get a feel for it. But, but uh, yes, uh, I, I think it is a marker that can be used as a uh, high level is, is concerning. I mean, that's kind of the, the bottom line there. If you see the markedly elevated level, it means something is wrong. It doesn't really point the finger necessarily to what we see. So you should kind of have that pre-specified problem in your mind, ideally at least, about what you're dealing with. And then it isn't perfect for ruling out disease. Even a disease like relatively slowly progressive ALS, which really isn't, necessarily a slow or, or trivial disease, can have a normal level. So you can't take a normal neurofilament life level as a guarantee that there's nothing there. Yeah. Well, those are some useful guidelines. Is there anything else that physicians should be aware of when considering whether or not to order this test? The Mayo Clinic um, test does have age normative values. And, and so we see quite different levels in different age groups. And I tend to think of the results coming back to me as sort of multipliers of the upper limit of normal. So patients with maybe one and a half times the upper limit of normal, I, I see that sometimes most my LS patients will run somewhere between three and eight times the upper limit of normal. So high above the, the uh, normal value. And um, again, the absolute numbers are, are, are quite different, again, from a youngster to, to somebody uh, in, their, in their 70s or 80s. And um, kind of be mindful of that age, the variability related to age, I think, is a key point. Sure. Very helpful. Um, now, uh, for the members of our audience that may be explaining this to patients or perhaps are even patients themselves, is there anything that patients should know about this testing? So most of my patients are ALS patients. Many of them are curious about if the drugs that we use on them have an effect on their ALS. Uh, this week, the FDA held an advisory board for the um, Confirmation product is an antisense oligonucleotide product, uh, which is now being advised to for an uh, accelerated approval based off neurofilament light levels uh, in serum using this methodology. And we're seeing that, again, more and more patients are wondering if, if what's happening to their levels. Are, are we seeing benefits there or not? Um, that requires repeated testing. Neurofilament light probably has a half-life of something like three months. So we don't expect to see immediate changes when we start something. Uh, and, and there isn't really proven effect on neurofilament with any product except for this maybe to person that's under current review. So uh, that's a it's a question that's asked, and I don't know if I have a firm answer, but yes, I, I think a lower level is better, and, and we try to optimize therapy for lower levels. Hmm. Interesting. Well, that's that's very helpful, I think. Um, as we're wrapping up, is there anything else that you'd like to add on this topic for our listeners? No, I, I think it's. I'm, I'm very excited to, to have this tool. I use it in a portion of my patients, again, uh, generally in questions regarding ALS. Well, great. That was really informative. I learned a lot. Um, I probably will not be one of the physicians ordering this test, but I can definitely help interpret and under or explain some of the things that you've shared with us now, which would be really valuable. Thank you very much again for joining us today. Thank you.
Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.